we are very pleased to be uh, joined by Stephen Gray, who is the Head of Research Support at the University of Bristol, who's going to be talking to us about uh, Virtual Reality uh, Reading Room. Hello, I'm Stephen Gray, and I'm the Head of Research Support at the University of Bristol Library. I want to talk to you today about a journey that the library has been on for a while now to build a 3D digital platform to showcase some of our unique cultural heritage collections. If you're having trouble imagining what I mean, here's an example on the screen at the moment. This is a purely digital virtual space uh, and you can visit in virtual reality, we're in a headset or in browser as a kind of a computer game experience. So why would you want to do this? Why would a library want a three dimensional digital virtual space to show some of its content? We know from 2D digitization that providing digital access can help us to protect fragile original collections. Digitization can also open up collections to new audiences, potentially international audiences for lots of collections. But maybe more importantly, it supports new types of use of those collections. So um, we've already started to do projects where we co-curate collections with members of the public, for example. We can use this kind of virtual digital space to bring together collections that are geographically dispersed around the world. And we're starting to believe that this is a good way to generate new knowledge. But the, the truth of it is, we don't really know the potential of these kind of spaces, but we believe that it's going to be very exciting in the future. I'd like to illustrate this by presenting two of our recent projects, the Blandford Collection and the Uncertain Space. The Blandford Bequest is a collection of antiquities held by the University of Bristol's Departments of Anthropology and Archaeology and Classics and Ancient History. It was donated to the university by Dennis Blandford, a retired classics teacher and alumnus of Bristol, and it includes Greek and Roman artifacts, terracotta figurines, pottery, glass bracelets and other jewellery, metal pins, roof tiles and even some textile fragments. The collection was left to the university as a bequest by Dennis Blanford in 2014, and we've been using it as a teaching and study collection ever since. The artifacts within the collection are not particularly accessible because they don't have a dedicated storage display case that students and staff can easily access for handling and research purposes. So we wanted to find a way to make the collection more accessible not just to our own students, but actually to the broader public. This became a particularly acute during COVID when we didn't have access to anything in person and everything had to be digital. So we wanted to find a way to allow our students to continue to work with the collection, but through a digital medium. So we had this problem where no one could access the building because of COVID. And our first idea was to take photographs of all the artifacts in the collection. We soon realized that whilst this would work for 2D items, it was a compromise for 3D objects. So we started to scan a few dozen uh, objects. This turned out really well, so we carried on and put about two weeks into the work, three people working for two weeks, and we managed to scan around 600 of the objects. Once we had them all scanned, we had the challenge of actually granting access to the digital copies of the objects. And our first idea was to put them into the research data repository, um, data.bris. We did this and they're still available online for anyone to use, but we realized that just putting 3D objects within uh, an online platform wasn't really enough. Those people who were not used to using 3D models, either in the teaching or research, still weren't using the objects, still had a technological barrier to using the objects. So our next idea was to put the 3D scanned objects into a virtual reality environment and allow anyone to download the VR environment for free and to work collaboratively within the space. I wanted to give you a view of the inside of the virtual reality environment, and this is it. As you can see, it looks like an old library. 
Hopefully this is engaging for the user, but the main reason is to give a sense of scale to the objects. When they're floating in a void, it's really hard to tell how big something is. Um, so this is the rostrum, and the rostrum has an overview of the Blandford bequest and also has what metadata exists for this collection here on the clipboards. So let's say I wanted to see the Byzantine oil lamp with stub handle, which is BB1048 and is in box B. I would just dial up box B here on the rostrum, and here it is. I can be as rough as I like because, of course, these are just digital surrogates of the objects. And at the oil lamp, I think, is this one here. Every object has its item number somewhere on it, and I can see that this is, in fact, BB1048. The resolution is pretty good. Uh, it's much higher resolution than you usually find within virtual reality, but it's not the full resolution we scan the object at. And if you were to look in the Databricks repository and download this object, you would get a much higher uh, resolution object. So you could say that it, the whole virtual reality experience in one way works like a glorified uh, catalog. It allows people to check the thing that they thought they wanted is in fact the thing that they want. I'm here on my own at the moment, but I could invite other people to sort through objects, uh, arrange things, uh, group things, uh, make lists within virtual reality, and so we could work in here collaboratively. We completed the Blandford project two years ago, and uh, at the end of the project, we realized we'd learned quite a lot. Um, so the first thing is there's a huge potential audience out there, and I think the experience was downloaded something like three and a half thousand times in the first six weeks. Um, we don't know very much about the audience and that's something that we are still working on. We don't know, for example, how satisfied they were or even really in what ways they were using the collection, but there's certainly a, a, an audience out there. Virtual reality isn't for everyone and we soon realized that uh, even those people that are you know, fans of virtual reality often don't have access to a headset. So, for example, for teaching, uh, if we want this uh, collection to be used in the university, we usually have to provide headsets as well. For the Blandford project, we were tied to a particular commercial platform, the Steam platform. And the experience will be around, I hope, for as long as the Steam platform will be around, but there's no guarantees there. So it's a vulnerability. For this particular project, we didn't involve any users at all, or even consult users. Uh, that was mostly due to the practicalities of conducting a project during uh, lockdown. But uh, for the next project I'm going to present to you, you'll see that was a, a very different story. The environment that we put together for the Blandford project wasn't reusable. It wasn't. It wasn't put together in that way. It wasn't intended to be reusable. If we wanted to, for example, um, present the same kind of environment with a different collection, the whole experience would have had to have been rebuilt, rebuilt from scratch. So you could see from uh, these points, we really didn't have longevity in mind. That wasn't a aim. The, the aim was to do something iteratively, to, to get something out there, to publish something which, which fit, fitted a particular purpose at a particular time. But the next project I'm going to present to you uh, was built from the ground up with longevity in mind. The Uncertain Space is a virtual museum for the University of Bristol. And it's quite unusual in that it's a museum first and virtual second. So it's got lots of the same things, it does lots of the same jobs as a real world museum, but it happens to be only digital. The Uncertain Space was funded through AHRC Capability for Collections funding, and it was our attempt to widen the audience to some of the University of Bristol special collections. We'd had some experience of providing virtual reality access to various objects and pictures before, and this was our attempt to do that in a more sustainable way, in a way that wouldn't stop at the end of a project, but would carry on, uh, and that's the uncertain space. The project had two main outcomes. The first was the virtual museum, but we realized that it would be quite boring to uh, release uh, an empty museum uh, to the public, so we had to create the first exhibition at the same time. 
So as well as the museum, we had the first exhibition, which is called Secret Gardens, and was co-produced with a group of young people. And Secret Gardens is basically a, it's focused on the public artworks of the university, um, but it includes objects, artifacts, 3D scanned objects, scanned images, uh, audio-visual clips from all kinds of university collections, all coming together around the central theme of of uh, environmental awareness and identity. The second phase of the project was to actually digitise the content that the young people had selected. It was a different types of process depending on the different types of object they were interested in. Uh, Audiovisual clips were digitised in the theatre collection. Um, 2D images were digitised both in the theatre collection and special collections and we had quite a lot of activity around 3D scanning. So 3D scanning the public artworks and the objects which were to go into the exhibition. There was also a phase of recording the young people's reactions. So they'd visit each of the public artworks and we'd record the, their immediate reactions to being there in the presence of the artwork and they're all included in the virtual exhibition too. One of the things that came through when we were doing the project is that putting together a virtual exhibition is very similar to putting together a real world exhibition. So the young people and the curators who look after the objects worked with Simon Fenn, who's a real world uh, exhibition designer and until this point had only worked with uh, real museum uh, exhibitions. But I think he found that there was a lot of commonality between designing a virtual exhibition and designing a real one. One of the big differences between the Uncertain Space and other virtual exhibitions that other organisations, museums, galleries have put together is that it was always thought of as being sustainable. That this is a space first and foremost and it would have different exhibitions, a rolling programme of exhibitions that would happen in the space. The Secret Gardens is the first exhibition. We're already putting together a, a programme of different exhibitions which will happen in the same space. We've now completed the initial setup phase of the uncertain space, and we have some uh, lessons that we learned along the way. The first one was to plan your publication route early on. There are lots of options, uh, none of which are perfect when it comes to sharing 3D virtual environments, but it's important to know which one you're headed for before you start. What we certainly didn't want was a uh, experience that we could only use locally. We wanted something that we could show uh, on local headsets, that we could have in headsets in our reading rooms, but that we could also share on the internet to access that much wider audience that I've spoken about. We knew this time around that we wanted to build in preservability and interoperability, and we didn't want to get tied to any particular hardware or software because the technology uh, advances so quickly and becomes obsolete so quickly. So we used standards like OpenXR so that we could build experiences which would work on more than one type of virtual reality headset, for example. We also compiled a list of our significant properties for our virtual experiences. And this would be familiar to anyone who's uh, used significant properties for things like document, digital preservation, or maybe audiovisual preservation. It's the idea that uh, rather than focusing on a, a particular software hardware at a particular time, you look at what the um, item does and you make sure as you try and preserve it into the future, that it continues to function in the same way. If anyone's interested in this, I'm more than happy to talk to you about the digital preservation aspects of uh, virtual spaces. I haven't really spoken about the technologies which underpin the work that we've been doing, um, and it's a whole other presentation in its own right. But if anybody wants to catch me afterwards and talk about the technological decisions that we've made and why we've made them along the way, I'm happy to speak about that. So what I would like to mention, and I'm very grateful for, is my own current HRC RLUK Professional Practice Fellowship. It's allowing me to take lots of the techniques I've been discussing and focus in on a particular community. I'm working with a group of autistic adults and we're putting together, co-producing a virtual reality environment, which I'm very much hoping will be uh, available, published uh, later this year. I also have to thank uh, Ed Fay and the senior management team uh, in the library at the University of Bristol for supporting this work and believing that it's got potential. I think it's very early days and we can't yet say what that potential looks like, 
but I can already see some peer organizations doing similar work and it would be excellent if we could come together and uh, build a community. So with that in mind, here are my contact details and lots of the work I've been discussing can be accessed via the hyperlink here. Thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. That's a really interesting um, and, and already raising um, thoughts and questions in, in my mind. And I'm so pleased that you mentioned the AHRC RUK uh, Fellowship Scheme, and we're very pleased and proud to have you as, as one of the fellows on, on, that, on that scheme. And I'm sure that that's going to produce a lot of really interesting uh, work as we move forward. Uh, we're going to go on to our um, um, next uh, uh, speakers, and we're going to across the country from uh, Bristol to uh, Cambridge, where we have uh, Augustina uh, Martinez garcia uh, and Alexia uh, Sutton from the University of um, Cambridge. Uh, Augustine, uh, Augustina is um, a head of uh, Open Research Systems at Cambridge and Alexia is uh, the Open Services, Open Access Service Manager. Hello. I'm Agustina Martinez and today I'll be presenting jointly with my colleague uh, Alexia Sutton. In this talk, we will provide an overview of key projects as part of the open research program being developed at Cambridge. The focus uh, will be on those concerned with the implementation of services to support scholarly publishing and more innovative approaches to early publication and open peer review. In terms of what we will cover today, first I'll give you some background uh, on the wider open research program before delving into the, the different projects. And then um, I will also give you a, a high level overview of the key areas uh, being developed as part of the infrastructure roadmap in particular. Then I'll hand over to Alexia, who will tell you all about the preprint service, as well as introducing the community led uh, journals project. And then I will talk uh, about uh, the Diamond Open Access Pilot project that we are currently undertaking, as well as telling you a bit about some upcoming work we have around uh, supporting innovation and new publishing models through using uh, repositories. In terms of the background to the open research infrastructure work, um, open research developments form part of a research portfolio um, at the university involving many units, not only the libraries, but in particular, the infrastructure roadmap that we are developing falls within the research collections strand of work that Cambridge University libraries are leading. In terms of the open research infrastructure roadmap, the vision for this program of work is to meet researchers needs across the full research life cycle, supply better integrated services that are underpinned by innovative and appropriate open systems and, and research infrastructure. And to mention that uh, the concept of open systems and infrastructure is really critical to us and the work that we do. Um, in terms of the areas that uh, the program covers, the first one is concerned with digital preservation. The libraries are undertaking a five year full program of work to implement digital preservation services and systems to ensure long term preservation of the research outputs of the university, as well as archives and collections that the libraries are responsible for. The second big area of work is around enhancing research data management services provision and uh, we want to gain a better understanding of researchers needs across the full research life cycle particularly in a complex environment like Cambridge where all of the services are really fragmented um, uh, in terms of providing support for research activities and then the third one is the one that is really of interest to the projects we'll be talking today and it's about the open research ecosystem and scoping future services and systems to support um, more open practices in a context of really rapidly changing scholarly uh, publishing environments. Hello, I'm Alexia. I'm going to talk in the next couple of slides about the preprint service that we've launched at the University of Cambridge. So in early March 2024, we launched a preprint service for Cambridge University researchers. The purpose of the service is to provide a high quality option for researchers who do not have a suitable, sustainable subject repository available to them. Apollo is underpinned by DSpace, a widely adopted open source repository platform. It is also a core trust seal certified repository and as such provides 
long-term digital preservation, persistent identifiers for the outputs it holds, and machine-readable metadata. So it provides a reliable and sustainable option for our researchers. The primary use case for the preprint service are those researchers who do not have a subject repository available to them at all. The idea is that they would be able to use Apollo as their preprint server. It would also be available to researchers who have concerns about the sustainability of their existing subject repository or those who would simply prefer to use Apollo instead. We haven't previously offered this service because we didn't have the technical infrastructure or capacity within the team to develop a non-essential service and staff it. However, following recent upgrades to both the university's repository Apollo and Elements, and with COVID out of the way, we felt that the time was right to revisit preprints. In addition, supporting early publication of research outputs enables open practices and aligns with community-led scholarly infrastructures in recent proposals, such as Coalition S's, towards responsible publishing. Services like this will allow us to engage with the wider scholarly communi community by participating initiatives such as Core Notify, where authors could choose from a list of participating overlay journals or open peer review services and request a review of a preprint that they have deposited in Apollo. The preprint service that we have developed uses existing infrastructure, specifically in the Cambridge context. This means using Elements and Apollo in the same way that we do for other output types. Researchers can complete an upload form and upload the file via Elements. This creates a ticket in our ticketing system. The upload is reviewed by staff and then deposited on their behalf into Apollo. The workflow which is outlined at the very top level on this slide is very simple and allows us to create new versions of a preprint as needed by the researcher. The process as set up involves staff in the open access team creating new versions of preprints for researchers rather than the researchers depositing them direct into Apollo. This is something that we might come back to in, at a future date. One of the limitations of the process is that we still need researchers to deposit their accepted manuscripts as they usually would on its own record and this is to ensure that we can retain the first date of deposit for ref audit purposes. The preprint record and the accepted manuscript record would be linked together. This is the part of the workflow that is the most clunky and probably from a researcher's perspective, the part that would not really be on par with other preprint servers where they can simply keep uploading uh, the preprints until it's finally accepted and they're all on the same record. But of course, these preprint servers don't have the same need to balance uh, reporting requirements for REF as an institution does. So the service is still really in its early days. It was only launched on the 11th of March. To support the launch of the service, we worked with the research information team on the communications of the service and also its development. As we integrated this launch into the pre-scheduled Apollo upgrade work, we have been able to piggyback on some of the early downtime communications and supplemented that with updates to the SharePoint website and blogs. We've also communicated on Teams, email and via the OSC and library newsletters. In these next few slides, we're going to talk about Diamond Open Access at Cambridge. But if you, before we go into the detail, I wanted to briefly introduce a study that the Office of Scholarly Communication has been running to better understand the community-led publishing ecosystem at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and this study feeds into the Diamond Open Access project that Agostina will discuss in the next few slides. The purpose of the study is to better understand what is taking place at the university, what motivates those involved and to gain insights into how we can support these initiatives. 
In turn, the results can inform us about the utility of alternative publishing avenues for researchers, not only in Cambridge, but all over the world. Through the study, we identified 34 community-led publishing initiatives at the university. The editorial board members of 20 of the journals were invited to take part in the study, and nine participated in semi-structured interviews. Something that became clear through the study is that the journals are maintained entirely by volunteer members, usually on a rolling basis, and rely on limited financial and technical support. The journals are also across a range of disciplines. The transcripts will be uploaded onto Apollo following approval from participants, and we're in the process of analysing the data and writing up a paper. As Alexia has mentioned, the OSC is currently leading a research project looking at community-led publishing across Cambridge. Um, interim findings suggest that, that there is a healthy ecosystem of self-publishing at the university, but that many of these journals require technical and publishing support for their main activities, particularly around preservation and discovery areas. Um, so, to provide support in those identified areas, we are undertaking a complementary project that is looking at the development of a service for Diamond Open Access Journal publishing supported using open repository platforms. Um, the scope for uh, such a service is uh, primarily student-led and academic-led publishing and only within the university. It's an internal service to begin with. Um, the way we are approaching the project is by having first a one-year pilot in which we will engage with researchers and explore whether open uh, platforms, in particular, uh, we will be using repository platforms um, based on this space, um, meet actually their needs around institutional publishing and can also be used as the basis for further development of a service in this area. In relation to the main aims of the pilot, um, the community-led journals project has actually been very useful to the pilot as it has helped us identify and engage with potential pilot participants. So far, we are working with three confirmed uh, Cambridge journals in the disciplines of history of arts, anthropology and architecture. Um, so we will really be exploring the suitability of this space open repository platform as one of the main aims of the pilot. Um, in particular, in its latest version, um, because this space has brought in advanced functionality that allows us to better represent journals' content structures and, and content in the platform, as well as allowing for visual theming customizations to tailor uh, the look and feel to the different uh, journals' requirements. And also it allows to, or it supports uh, a range of submission and content management workflows. Um, Lastly, another very key aim of the pilot is to gather insights about what it takes to transition from pilot to service. And in particular, we are looking at estimating resourcing requirements, both in terms of uh, service management and infrastructure, and then looking at long-term access, storage and, and preservation as well from the more technical angle. In terms of what work is being planned or has already taken place uh, through the pilot, we have uh, now set up both a demo and production instances of the online journal publishing platform using pretty much a vanilla DSpace 7 instance with minor uh, theming customizations to meet the look and feel of other library services that we offer. We are currently assessing and documenting the possible submission and content management workflows within the platform. And this is to ensure that they meet the different journals requirements um, and then we will commence work with pilot participants to support key activities around exploring journal content, structuring and pages design, uh, basically the visual theming that I was mentioning before, and then uh, defining and testing content submission and editorial management workflows in the platform. These key activities will allow us to assess whether journal teams can easily self-manage submission, editorial and content management activities through the platform. This is particularly important as the way we envision the service is to work 
in a self-managed way, where library provides the technical infrastructure and user support with some basic level of publishing support, but most of the journal management actually lies within the uh, editorial teams. Lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, upcoming work that we are planning in relation to supporting innovative publishing models uh, through repositories. Repositories are increasingly playing an expanded role in transforming scholarly publishing. New, more transparent and equitable models of scholarly publishing are now gathering momentum and there is an increased community interest, uh, as if, uh, some of the projects uh, like the community-led journals are demonstrating, in independent journal publishing and open peer review. Repositories, together with external peer review services, can offer a new model for Diamond Open Access Publishing, one that is actually flexible and based on standard and interoperable technologies, and it can also lower the technical and publishing costs by distributing the publishing functions across the different services involved in the process. For us, the launch of the preprint service in Apollo, together with new technical developments in the underlying repository platform, this space, will make it possible to explore new roles for institutional repositories in the wider scholarly ecosystem. In particular, what we want to do is to pilot a core Notify implementation in Apollo to link repository content with peer review services uh, or overlay journals. For us, the main aim is to provide an easy alternative uh, for researchers that wish to publish open access, while at the same time, support alternative models such as Coalition S's uh, Publish, Review and Curate that Alexia has mentioned before. So how does the publication process work when, when using Core Notify in repositories such as Apollo? Well, first, um, authors deposit and submit manuscripts uh, in the repository, and then the author chooses to submit a request for publication in a subscribing overlay journal or open peer review service. This request um, triggers for the repository to send a review or endorsement request to the overlay journal with a link to the repository manuscript. Next, the journal assesses the relevance of the manuscript and agrees to review it. And then this sends an acknowledgement notification of agreement to review to the repository from the journal. Then uh, review processes take place and a manuscript is accepted for publication. Then an announcement uh, request uh, or notification is sent by the journal into the repository with a link to the publication uh, web page. And lastly, then uh, cross-linking takes place um, where repository will link to the journal's record and the journal uh, will include a link to the manuscript in the repository. So um, at the moment, this is work like, you know, very in pretty much very early stages. Um, so the next steps for us are we are currently waiting for the technical implementation to be available later in the year in the year in the repository. And until then, we will be then gathering different uh, use cases as well as exploring collaboration with relevant stakeholders within the university and externally. And um, that will be the end of the presentation for us. Thank you. OK, thank you so much to Augustina and uh, Alexia. Um, really interesting. And and I, I love the fact that we're only two presentations into the conference, but we're already seeing the vast range of activities that uh, libraries are undertaking to support research. But we're also beginning to see the um, commonalities uh, because both presentations have, have talked about digital present preservation, they've talked about um, um, audience engagement, and they've talked about sustainability. So there's variation, but there's also key themes coming out, and we're only two presentations in. Um, we're going to turn now to our, our third presentation for this uh, session, and uh, really pleased to, to welcome Sam Nesbitt, who is the Open Access Librarian at the University of Sussex. Um, Sam's going to be talk talking to us about the um, um, what's been happening within the University of Sussex in their support uh, for open research. And I'm very pleased to say that um, um, Sam is going to be speaking to us live uh, for this session. So um, welcome, Sam. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here today. And thank you to Agustina, Alexia and, and, and Stephen for some fascinating presentations so far. Uh, I'm going to pivot slightly and talk a little, bit, a little bit about how our research and open scholarship team has adapted to the fast-paced world of open research support. 
uh, detail some of the ways in which our support service has changed in the last few years. Um, I'll cover how the team has grown, how our specialisms have been both enhanced and challenged by developments in the sector, and how we might measure success in such an environment. Um, I should note that this is very much a personal reflection, and my title refers to a feeling I had when I first started as an open access librarian in, in March 2020, back in the midst of time. As you recall, uh, there was quite a lot going on in the world around that time. And to me, and my perhaps blinkered view, uh, new to the sector, the basic idea of open access and its mechanisms seemed to be a no-brainer. Uh, I remember myself saying, more transformative agreements, please, uh, ignorantly opining into a Zoom screen as, as the world crumbled around me, um, as well as thinking, I'm sure this ref open access policy thing can't be that complicated. Well, the, the open goal of OA seemed to me just that an easy chance to grab at the time. If you fast forward four years, I've done a lot of learning. The scales have fallen from my eyes. And it's not just the jaded, worn face you see before you that has changed. Um, open access publication, my area of work, has been subsumed into the broader open research agenda. Um, and, and the variety of meanings, practices, and aims being discussed in this environment presents a series of challenges, I think, to quote-unquote traditional library work and the skills we thought we needed to do it. And so how have the goalposts moved? Um, before I get onto that, first some context. Here is the obligatory slide about the institution and its numbers. We have around 19,000 students and about 2,000 uh, research students and staff. And I, I give these numbers to contextualize the size of our team, which is currently made up eight people um, and the cohort they serve. Many of you will have smaller teams. Uh, many of you will have larger teams, but I think that we can all agree that despite the sunny picture that you might see on the slide now, libraries in higher education are working in slightly gloomier times, more stretched times. And so I would like to emphasize at this early stage that when I talk about resource and development, I'm very mindful that not everyone will have had that affordance. Um, but I would also say that we're not immune to those self-same pressures and we too have come up against our limits in terms of resource recently. So what are we talking about when we talk about open research? Um, the two presentations prior to mine have given to very, very different conceptions as well, which is really, really helpful. Um, it's a slippery term, um, uh, but we tend to think about it at Sussex um, as opening up practice, um, identifying and improving the composite parts of the research life cycle um, with a focus on reproducibility and research integrity, a kind of transparency as ethical mode. Um, all of this is limbed very beautifully, I think, by products like Octopus and its breakdown of these stages and kind of de-emphasizing the final narrative product, although that's still very important. Um, we also see it as about cultural change. Um, there was a talk at the Open Research Week run by uh, Edge Essex and the Liverpool Universities by Kay and Rachel at Glasgow, gave a wonderful keynote um, talking about the kind of what it takes to change research culture and institution. And here at Sussex, we very much foreground Open's part in that cultural shift. Um, and research culture includes, must include the mechanisms for both academic and, and professional services, reward and recognition. And so the carrots, not the sticks leading us forward, I suppose. Um, so given this vast remit, this expanding remit, what does the library currently offer and, and, and how has that changed? Um, I don't imagine some of the changes or complications I'll mention here will be new to people exactly, but I'd be certainly curious to hear if people had similar experiences or whether Sussex is somehow operating in a bubble. Um, Open access remains part of this expanded picture of open research, certainly. Um, but even that has become much more complicated, I think. With every new transformative or transition agreement comes new levels of uh, often labyrinthine bureaucracy and procedural admin. And here I must pause to give a shout out to the absolute champions at JISC for their stellar work in negotiating uh, with both perhaps might be called rapacious profiteering and disgruntled librarianship. So it's amazing the work that you guys do. So anyone from JISC in the audience, thank you very much. Um, to give a sense of how this has expanded, we had two transformative agreements in 2020 when I started, and we now have 19 agreements, many of which meet that transitional or transformative definition. Likewise, there were complications in open access finance that have arisen. Just when we thought we had a handle on managing our UKRR block grant, along comes the monograph pot, and the various different complications that come with stage one and stage two, et cetera. And then the explosion of, of really encouraging to see rights retention policies across the UK and all the legal scrutiny and advocacy that goes along with them. And so, so much has changed in, in my small area of open research, open access publication in as little as three years. Um, our involvement with the technology that supports open research, again, as, as uh, described very well by, by Augustina previously, um, at Sussex, here is, our engagement with that has increased too. We had implementation of a new CRIS system. 
We had the fallout of a technical crisis during the REF submission. We had the subsequent uh, very, very hands-on repository migration. And all of this required a technical capacity that historically we would have perhaps ceded to our IT services department or to our, our wonderful but small library systems team. And both of those were involved, but we had a real hands-on approach to those things. Um, our teaching offer in open research encompasses open access publication and things like copyright. Very much looking forward to the workshops on Friday, by the way. Um, and now an introduction to open principles and practice, but we've needed to reflect on what's being taught in the schools, perhaps outside our view and how that might differ. And so using these sessions as kind of active knowledge exchange with the different kind of cohorts that we might attract. And lastly, policy, not just the development of our rights retention policy at Sussex, um, but our ability to decipher funder policy too, um, trying to explain the difference to researchers between transformative agreements, transitional agreements and transformative journals um, was enough to make them lose the will to live uh, as almost as much as I did. And I don't see that changing anytime soon, given that these transformations or transitions are coming to an end, open question mark. And so who does all this? Um, our service is, is, is notionally split across three distinct but overlapping areas. And I'll name check our wonderful team because I know they might be watching a watch party in Sussex. So for research support, we have Maggie, Tom and Jack. Um, open publication is both our open access service and our nascent open press. And that's Henry, Katrina and Stuart. Uh, and for our repository and Chris systems, we have Sally, Stuart, Maggie and Jack. You'll notice that those names are repeated. We have staff that work across different areas. It's not a huge team, but it's not as small as some. Historically, it's been between three and five people, and I know that size of team will be very familiar to lots of people watching now. Um, but the growth of open research and its remit is directly responsible for that increase here at Sussex. Um, likewise, our research data management team is an extra member now, and we certainly expect that to be a growth area too, and interlinked with our work. So given all these changes and the new demands that we found on our skills, the question becomes, how do we roll with the punches? How do we adapt, even thrive, or perhaps more formally, what will library support for open research look like in the next five years? Even in a, a, an ever-changing field like open research, it often behoves management to think in the medium or long term. Um, we can be, quote unquote, dynamic, agile, operate on the fly, but not everyone works that way. And it's not always the most helpful. But we do expect our, our, service, uh, our support service to change uh, iteratively and be able to suddenly pivot towards what our stakeholders require, but also towards new areas for exploration. And, and the aim at Sussex, I think, is to ensure that the team feel confident, certainly, but also excited for the challenges to come um, and trying to embed a culture of continuous learning is, is a major focus. We've got new members of the team as well to which to whom uh, for whom rather these challenges might seem more intimidating and exciting. And, and the idea is to kind of um, leverage the skills they already have and make sure that the excitement is the, is the main focus. And so to that end, uh, what's next at Sussex? Um, this slide reflects some of the more exciting challenges we face and for which we're actively planning. Um, we're looking to develop our open publishing offer and are currently recruiting an editorial manager to oversee this development. And you can see some of our flagship titles on the right here. We have an open research technologies hub uh, that provides a kind of central location in the library for teaching on and the use of open hardware, as well as a space, a kind of catch-all space really for all manner of open research teaching um, it's, it's staffed mainly by uh, one person, and I'll give Andre a shout out now, uh, uh, who works in biological sciences, the purest embodiment of open research practice and principle that I've ever met. He's absolutely wonderful. Um, he's also helping us do uh, the Open Science Community Incubator course, which is a 14 week program um, that he's essentially undertaking with our occasional help. Um, and that seeks to build a community uh, of open research practice. And, and the real focus is making sure it's researcher led um, and representative of different disciplines and career stages, but certainly with library involvement, uh, especially in the area of advocacy. Um, we've seen some amazing stuff from Stephen this morning on, on opening up collections and how you might frame that. Um, we'll certainly be investigating the technical opportunities uh, afforded by things like that. Probably not anything quite as fancy as that, but we'll certainly be looking to Bristol uh, for, for conversation, I think. Um, We'll also kind of focus on more traditional notions of collections in terms of our subscriptions and the repurposing of budgets there. Again, a motto that I seem to have in the back of my head since I heard Dominic at Salford say it was, the aim is to enable, not acquire. And I think that's a great way to approach these problems. And finally, with policy, along with other institutions with so-called rights retention policies, we'll be monitoring progress with ours. 
um, and working with partner institutions to provide help and guidance where we can, I think. I, I received, just like most of you, with a mixture of dismay and excitement that monographs are indeed involved in the REF consultation. And so I wonder if there's space for investigation there. All of which is to say we're going to be very busy, but I hope you'll agree there's a lot of exciting work to be done there. Uh, and the question becomes then who will do it? It's going to be the same team. Uh, it's going to be the same wonderful team that we've got that I've already described with the addition of one extra post in terms of the open press. And I sincerely hope a flourishing uh, open science or scholarship community made up of champions across different levels. Um, I also would note that our, our newish data analyst in post sprang to mind when, I, again, listening to Kay and Rachel at Glasgow talk about exploratory data use. I'm sure I wasn't the only person to write down the words, write reports nobody asked for. Um, and we're certainly keen to exploit the data we have access to to see what, what patterns emerge and how we can approach these problems. And so finally, going back to the original slide about what success would look like in terms of open research, I think our exposure to and, and collaboration with working researchers across disciplines will mean that our own processes might come under scrutiny, and that should perhaps be welcomed. Um, we also stand to learn a great deal in both technical skill and contextual understanding. I think the more we partner with uh, external um, institutions, we're part of the Eastern Art Consortium now, or the OIPA, the Open Institutional Publishing Association, the more we can contribute to cultural change outside our institution. That said, I think it should start at home. And I had a fascinating exchange with a colleague yesterday who questioned why so much talk about research culture was ahistorical that didn't really take into account an institutional history or character as if research culture, capital R, capital C, was somehow the same everywhere, objective. And I, I think he's absolutely right. We'll need to focus on what Sussex is and was and try and embed uh, this change accordingly, accordingly, rather, uh, ensuring that open research practice and commitments are reflected in the institution's priorities and, and thusly in reward and recognition. And so my hope is that, as, as uh, a colleague said to me yesterday, open research becomes to universities what digital became to collections, librarians or archivists. Not scary anymore. In fact, accepted, exciting, business as usual. Um, and so in summary, we, we think the library has a key part to play in the development of open research at Sussex. It's going to take a lot to, to skill our team and to continue with that development. Um, but for now, I'll just end this kind of personal reflection with a, with a simple invitation to anyone in the audience. If, if colleagues from other libraries feel similarly where they are, or if any of this has resonated or piqued interest, please do get in touch. We'd love to talk to you and in the spirit of openness and collaboration that the Sussex Values seem to promote. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks very very much, Sam. That was a, a, a brilliant um, um, explanation of, of the complexity of this space uh, and the the, the 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 range of areas that um, that um, we're all, all having to deal with. I'm going to invite all of our speakers to join us uh, now. Um, if you could switch on your your video and uh, microphones, and we'll um, go through some of the the questions. There's still time to put more uh, questions into the, the Q and A. Um, there's already been um, some discussion within the Q and A, and some of the questions are, are being being answered. But I, I, I will want to pick up on on some of those that uh, and perhaps go a little bit more depth. Um, if I start, Stephen, with you, there's some, been some questions about about funding, and um, you've explained how you know there's been a variety of, of funding um, there. But I just wondered if you wanted to say more about how uh, what the business case is that you, for for some of this activity. Um, you've you said right at the beginning, I think that it's it's not entirely clear yet what the research usage use will be. Um, I, you know, it's it's what what. How, how are you persuading uh, people to uh, to fund these things? Uh, yeah, so I, I think one of the one of the comparisons I make is with the dawn of the internet, where uh, it, it was not clear for a while there what a website would do for your organisation. I think it's similar with sort of virtual digital environments. I think drawing that comparison kind of helps put things in perspective. I mean, maybe it may be a flash in the pan, but I sincerely doubt it now. I mean, virtual reality, for example, has been around for maybe ten years in its current form. And it's being used more and more. I think we, the older the technology gets, the easier it is to make that case that somebody should fund it. Um, but I also think it's quite diverse. The use of, is quite diverse. So I mentioned widening audiences, and I think that's a, a, a kind of a noble and fundable activity. But also new uses, doing things with collection that you couldn't do before. So I suppose what I'm talking about is collections as data in a in a spatial, three dimensional way. 
I think also that's quite a, a strong fundable idea. But basically, we only get funding from those uh, organizations who are willing to fund innovation, I think, at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I, I, I was struck by was your um, comment about dig digitalization as being um, um, a tool for preservation, um, uh, but then also the um, reliance on specific vendors and and I think one of the one of the um, 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 examples you gave you, you you weren't entirely sure how long that would exist for necessarily um, but then you had said you had some thoughts about digital pres preservation of virtual spaces I wonder if you could if you wanted to expand a little bit on on, on that Ooh, how long do we have uh, <laughs> so I think that's one of the pieces of the jigsaw that's been missing from these kind of interactive game type environments for a while now and I big for good reason because it's very difficult and it's inherently built on technologies, most of which are commercial. So you always have that obsolescence built into doing anything like this. And it's baby steps in terms of um, preservation and interoperability, I think. But we, we're making those steps. Uh, my big, big change for us is embracing significant properties model when it comes to these 3D environments. I think part of it is lessons learned. You've only got to do a couple of projects which then shuffle off and are inaccessible. To, to kind of learn the hard way that you, you shouldn't really be putting lots of time and money into something which has only got very, very slight longevity built in. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of reducing all these things to the way they work, the job they do, and looking to preserve that rather than looking to preserve any particular hardware or software. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, if I can turn to Cambridge now again, actually, the question of preservation. So there was a there was a, a question that came through which um, you've answered about um, uh, engagement with legal deposit, but there, I think there was a, a very interesting question about long term preservation of of uh, scholarly outputs, uh, especially in, um, in 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 some of these smaller academic led. Um, 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 journals which perhaps don't have that access to infrastructure. So I, I think in your answer you said you, you, the report will focus, a, well, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on preservation, but again, I don't know if there's something you'd want to say now about, about that. Um, unfortunately, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The two people who um, are writing the report aren't aren't here, um, and so I, I think I think that there's certainly um, a strong need to address address it in the report that there, that that is being written, um, but in terms of the like the details of of what of what it's going to contain, oh, well, we'll see. Uh, Agustina, do you have anything else to, to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in terms of the preservation, yeah, yeah. So, for example, for the Diamond um, Journals platform, we are actually going to be exploring, in addition to our actual preservation system that is being developed as part of the, the libraries program that I mentioned, the wider program, we are also going to look at clocks as well in terms of uh, preserving all of the content on of the journals in the platform. Uh, so either way, we we think with, with the journals, actually, we have the good opportunity to explore clocks as well, whereas with the internal digital preservation system, we are looking more at uh, the scholarly works in Apollo in the repository, but more so as well, all of the other things that I mentioned, uh, like the archives and all of the other libraries collections, and that are that are relevant as well. So yeah, we will be exploring those two options. Okay, oh, brilliant. Thank you. And uh, the, the sort of um, um, issues about um, uh, infrastructure, if you like. One, one was um, a question about whether or not DSpace provides uh, inbuilt editorial workflows to support Diamond, or is that something you've had to add? It, it does. Um, uh, it does by default. Um, it's, it's just important to bear in mind that um, we are kind of focusing on, on sort of DIY, do-it-yourself journals, which means the repository is a more general system that is, is designed to fulfill a range of, of use cases. Therefore, some of that functionality of review workflows, in particular, managing um, reviews of content uh, and the different stages of the publication, they are there, but are not perhaps as professional as, as, as one and as the ones available in those uh, platforms that are specifically designed for journal publishing, the more commercial ones, for example. So what we've done with the pilot 
was actually explore the different range of options and working with the participants because some of them would like to actually perform the peer review and uh, anything outside of the platform and they will use just the platform for publishing the content but for other journals they want to actually do they want to do everything in in the repository and uh, we are exploring the different options but yeah out of the box this space in particular in the latest version it has support for those uh, review workflows and in fact, we've been using it, using them for a while uh, in the repository, where actually when we review open access publications we get or data, there is already functionality for, for the workflows and the review in there. And, and a nice follow-up question there would be, um, if there was one, if you had a magic wand and you could generate some piece of national or international infrastructure which would support these this type of activity, is there, is there anything missing that you think we really need X? be it a preservation solution or workflow solution or or are you are you are you content with the tools that you have? Well I think it's with with these tools it's about actually uh the kind of the network building and the fact that some of the within the kind of the scholarly work publishing environment there are different stages and different systems that take part in the whole process so that's why when I was mentioning uh, in particular the plan S is uh, towards responsible publishing projects and their model for publishing review and curate and basically delegating the different publishing functions to the different services that are best placed for doing that. For example, publishers for peer review and uh, offering ethics and, and transparency checks, those kind of things. And then the content can be managed by the institutions, for example, as well. Preservation. Yeah, but yeah, some central, there's been a number of um, initiatives in the past to try to centralize things. Like, for example, there was a project with JISC for the National Repository for Data Management. And it kind of turns out that, you know, it's it's more like looking at, at a more decentralized things where the different institutions uh, play play a part in those. Yeah, I think it's a question of scale, isn't it? And, and deciding what needs to be done centrally and what needs to be done in, in a distributed way. And I think for all of all of uh, the, the presentations um, we've had today, there was that question. I mean, we don't necessarily need everybody, every member of our UK or every research library in the world, or they won't be able to make that sort of investment in time and 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 and, and resource to do everything that we've heard from from you all so are there other ways in which we can help by doing some of that collectively and then just focusing on what really needs to be done locally or you know work, working out what that best balance is i think is, is, is an interesting question certainly for us as a, as a membership organization it's, a, it's an interesting question to, to think think about that um uh, if i could uh turn to sam for, for a couple of somebody's asked about the open hardware lab um and um what's 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 in it and, and what how do you use it is that something that you've, you you're you're um looking after or, or, or part of uh yeah we're, we're certainly part we collaborate with with andre and the hub i've just put a link in the chat there to a, a blog post for ukrn that he recently published that describes some of the work they do um, it's basically the most enlivening and uh, wonderful place to go because you can get into a, a talk about what you're doing in the library and then it scales out to um, embedding technology hubs across the world. Um, incredibly impressive work. That One of the more local projects that they're focusing on is a recycling project that will recycle plastic bottles at the institution into the filament that's used for 3D printing. And so what they're doing is building um, 3D microscopes is one option, one um, uh example rather um and then sharing uh you know the the code and various different instructions to be able to do that and they partner with um trend in africa and places in uh, nigeria as well and about building microscopes there and so andre is very good at giving presentations about how these things can be piloted uh everywhere else so it's kind of very much open research in practice um because it's based in the library we then get into conversations and use that space for uh, more practical teaching sessions we do. Um, he's running a, a Python for beginners to which lots of library staff are going. So there's lots of different stuff that goes on there and it's a really useful hub. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And thanks for, for that link. That, that's really useful. Um, I, I'm sure you, you'll have, have, have seen this question uh, from Rebecca Astur, but I, I don't know how, how keen you might be to answer it about whether you view transformative agreements as, as feeding the problems of commercial publishers, uh, expanding control over the research process or as 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 providing um, countering solutions. 
Um, and if so, how? I, is that something you <laughs> would like to? Uh, I can spend, I can offer my person, a personal opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose that the reason I mentioned that that ridiculous statement I made in 2020 about more of these, please, is because I've I've suffered the consequences of more of them. Um, uh, I think they do feed the problem. Um, I understand why they exist, and I understand why we as an institution have signed up to so many. But um, absolutely concur with what I think is the sentiment of Rebecca's question that it does um, concentrate the problem. Um, it certainly concentrates the money. And uh, or for all the talk of walkaways that we've seen over years, here we are still with massive deals for the massive publishers and the same profits are going to the same places. But again, it's not representing Sussex, just the personal opinion. Um, so uh, perhaps best to have a conversation about that offline. Yeah. Um, perhaps for, for international colleagues, um, our, our, our friends at JISC have just published a, a significant report into, into transformative uh, agreements and um, the, 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 you know, a, a review of where we are with them. And the, the headline perhaps is that they're, they're not transforming particularly quickly. So journals are, are not moving from subscription based to, to open access in, in anything like a, a, a reasonable um, timescale, uh, which then begs the question of, of what we do about that and what sort of models we'd like to see. And, and that's a, a, an issue that we'll come back to uh, over, over the rest of the, of the, of, of the conference. Um, the other thing um, we've mentioned rights retention, um, and this um, a, again for, for for colleagues outside of the UK, this is uh, something that's happening a lot within our universities. Um, we are now moving to to a position where um, um, universities are putting in policies which ask their um, um, uh, researchers to um, retain uh, uh, the, the the rights to deposit um, papers into um, into local repositories and therefore not to give full rights or copyright over to 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 publishers. I think I could be wrong, but I think all three institutions represented here um, have uh, rights retention policies in place now, uh, and the vast majority actually of our UK members do. Uh, this that's a that's an introduction to the question, which is is Sam whether or not you 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 you're seeing any um, change in research behaviour yet, or is it is it too early? Uh, it's, it's still quite early for us, but I suppose we ours uh, didn't really necessitate a change in behaviour, and that we still accept we still ask people to do the same thing as to deposit their accepted manuscripts. What we then subsequently do with them, um, and so it was kind of it was very much a, a soft launch of our policy because we didn't uh, mandate the inclusion of a statement in the in the manuscript. It was very much the prior license, prior obligation, granting us non exclusive license, and so we haven't seen changes in behaviour exactly. But when we've talked about the policy and it's um, it's how it can help people achieve compliance, et cetera, potential inclusion for REF. We've gotten a very good response, um, but because it's only been live since October last year, um, we're kind of gathering together data on it, um, but we've already calculated the kind of the rough potential savings we've made from not spending uh, money on APCs for things that we've made open via the green route. And even in this last six months, that's sizable. Um, uh, and so it depends, you can make those calculations sound bigger than they are, uh, obviously. Um, because of press transparency and whatnot but so I think it's a different it's it's working it's fantastic and we've had very very little pushback um so I'm, I'm very encouraged the uh, I, I I think that is very encouraging and and my anecdotal contribution to this is that um for those institutions that have gone down the rights retention route there has been it has been remarkably uncontroversial we're on, on, on campuses uh, so there doesn't seem to be uh, you know um, 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 it's not something that's been imposed upon upon researchers they they, they seem to have welcomed um, it um i i wanted to go back actually uh to augustina and uh, alexia because I, I missed the question about infrastructure which is about um whether it's from martin wolf and liverpool about whether overlay journals are being indexed in 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 databases like scopus uh, I guess also other databases like DOAJ and, and, and such like, and, and and are you working to 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 help the academics to to get their journals into into these um, significant pieces of infrastructure? That's a very good question. So I don't know the answer for um, the one about the overlay journals, but uh, we are certainly exploring um, indexing in uh, DOAJ for 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 some of the journals we will be piloting with. But no, I'll, I'd like to find out actually about overlay journals, because I know it's, it's relatively kind of newish and uh, probably not so many is the answer, but uh, it's worth actually exploring. I don't know for sure. Okay. Yeah, we, I think people will be interested to to know how 
what the process is, how easy it is, um, and 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 because clearly these are these are important um, uh, databases that um, it's uh, it, it's it's good to get um, the, the the titles into. I wanted to um, sort of end on on a a, a more uh, a more philosoph philosophical question, which I'm I'm, I'm going to throw at you all, um, which I haven't given you notice of, I'm afraid, but uh, so I apologise. But what struck me in this in this conversation is that there's a lot of um, new activity that you're all undertaking, new roles for the for, for the libraries, and, and new ways of working with with researchers. And 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 I and I wondered to what extent the activities that you're undertaking, what you're what you're doing, are um, are reactive. So researchers are coming to you; they're coming with needs, and you're saying, well, "This is what we're going to do." And how much of it is proactive? It's it's the library uh, community identifying. Well, what we see as being problems, what we see as being gaps, and then offering solutions to the researchers. Um, I suspect, and I don't want to preempt your your your, your answers, but I, I suspect the the, the the real answer is it's a mix of both. Uh, but um, I don't know. Can, can I, I'm going to throw that out to you, um, and I'm going to be a very unfair. I'm going to ask Stephen if he has some some thoughts on that first. I think the, yeah, those, both of those, yeah, mix 50-50. I think but the both of the uh, uh, projects that I presented, the first one was driven very much as a support need from the library. And the second one was as preempting some of that and putting something in place, hopefully efficiently and, and a bit of cost saving before the need was properly identified. Um, and I can't go without mentioning the, the my own professional practice fellowship uh, which is kindly funded by um, RORUK and um, AHRC. And that's very much about uh, leadership within research. So I think the, that that's the future, if you like. I think that's, that's the direction of travel is trying to preempt some of those use cases before they become critical and address them as early as possible, uh, resources allowing. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I was I was very struck by, by, by your, your comments about, you know, we're not entirely sure yet about what the research... Um, 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 impact it will be of of doing some of these things, and I, I think that's uh, having space in which to have that ex to explore in that way. I think is 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 really interesting. Um, thanks. Uh, so moving over to to, to Cambridge, Alexia, um, uh, Augustina. I mean, some of some of that activity is is being driven by by um, uh, researchers who have, who have already set up their journals, but you know, some of it is also providing solutions, perhaps that. Um, researchers don't know about yeah certainly i mean thinking about the preprint service um i mean the you know the primary use case for that are actually people who are not preprinting they don't have the culture of it and so yeah so to that is proactive we're trying to identify an opportunity there that we can provide and enable and facilitate a, like a, a change in practice um and like you say, and then there are other people within the university who, who who already have needs, but perhaps they haven't been articulated, you know, in terms of the the infrastructure that they're trying to work with, with their diamond open access journals, and it's not really quite working for them, but not necessarily hasn't been articulated to us. So those, I think, are proactive, but certainly, you know, there's, there's always a case of reacting as, as, as well. So I do think it's a mix. Yeah. Uh, how I so if I'm going to so a little follow up question there about about those communities that have not been used to 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 working with preprints, how respect uh, re, how responsive or otherwise have have you found people? Well, it's <laughs> very early days. I think um, it's going to take work to you know go go to the departments, talk to them, um, you know, have open access briefings that specifically talk about the. Oh, I think we may. Have, I think you may have frozen, Alexia. Um, or is it just me? No, I, I think we. I think we've lost you momentarily. But um, um, I, I think we 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 got the 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 message that work is work needs to be be done. Obviously, I don't know if you want to. to yeah, to yeah. I I wanted to expand a little bit as well because uh, we've actually we've been talking recently with people uh, involved in the area of policy development, and it was quite interesting that they mentioned preprints as well, and they mentioned whether they could deposit the preprints in the Apollo, and it was quite it was quite timely because you know we just launched the service uh, like a week ago only, so it's it's a mix. But I think Alexia was mainly what she was mainly saying around the advocacy going to departments is something like we really need to do proactively first. Um, we've had some 
positive uh, responses from some of those uh, disciplines where traditionally they don't they don't do preprints too much. But then there's been as well some um, some issues uh, raised by them, like for example, scooping and 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 you know problems around uh, those myths around like publishing early and and someone kind of spook you, uh, scoop your work and things like that. So that is where you know things like persistent identifiers, DOIs for preprints to really kind of assure them to try to demystify uh, those those myths otherwise. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, point. And it's really interesting how those myths continue within different academic um, disciplines. So you can you can you can dispel it in one place, but that doesn't mean to say that it has it, 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 it's gone from an, from another. Uh, that's a, a great point. Um, Sam, um, do you have some some thoughts on that general sort of reactive proactive um, um, split? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, much like the previous speakers, I would say it is a mixture of both, I suppose, kind of um, distilled into the example of our open press. It, it came off um, um, our, our pilot textbook was a biological psychology textbook where an academic had decided that they wanted to try and do it themselves. And where could they go for help? And they came to us. We then jumped at the chance and it kind of drove forward this this trial year we had with this open press. Now it's very much us advocating for alternative publishing modes and going out to our authors and seeking input from them and so we've kind of taken it and run with it and i think that tends to be the model we favor at sussex we're trying to be more exploratory but again given the resource restrictions that i've described that are prevalent everywhere i think um it, it's finding that balance but um and that's why we've got such an em emphasis on on community i suppose is that we can learn what kind of things we might explore and might be proactive in following from the wonderful researchers at our institution so it's, it's, it's listening and then acting i suppose for us Okay, brilliant. Um, I, I think there is just sorry. There was one more. I've just um, it's just been pointing out there was one more question that I missed. A specific question about open peer review and DOI, DOIs. Um, Augustine, do you want to to take that? Yeah, I was going to say that that is that is a really good question. Uh, because when I was talking about um open peer review uh, as part of the the core notify workflow and things like that. It was more actually in that case the reviews being somewhere else, like in an external service. But certainly, we've we've explored as well the possibility of having open peer reviews in the repository too, and uh, that is certainly possible. And yet, the OIs can be minted like uh, for those reviews, like you do with with other scholarly works. So it's it's a good use case too. Yeah, 